Hello, City of Champions. Hope you're all having an awesome week. Is February just flying by for anyone else? I mean, we're halfway to March already. Can't believe that. I do feel like we're getting into the last leg of winter that seems to kind of drag on indefinitely before slowing, slowly breeding into spring. Anyway, make sure you acknowledge something you're looking forward to every week. Just keep you excited about life. Now, speaking of being excited about life, that's exactly what my guest this week is. Sar Safa is a driven young man who is accomplishing tremendous things in the Edmonton community. He's an entrepreneur from the get. Sar saw a unique culture of innovation and collaboration in premier cities around North America and asked, why can't Edmonton support an ecosystem like that? So out of that question was born Sea Tribe Festival, an event focused on bringing innovation and enlightened thinking to underrepresented communities through art and culture. I had the pleasure of meeting Sar today for the first time, and so the episode kind of exists in a, it's a less structured form than normal. Uh, and Sar also live broadcasts at our meeting, so make sure you add him on Facebook to check out the video. That's S-A-H-R space S-A-F-F-A. This conversation with Sar got me really fired up about the potential of his movement and the future of our city here. I'm really grateful I got some time with the inspiring and thoughtful guy, and I know you're going to enjoy our conversation. Are we live here? We are live, yeah. Right on. So we are actually doing a, uh, a podcast with, uh, with Shane. He has a podcast here called The City of Champions, um, and you know, I, I was humbled to get the opportunity to, to partake in, a, in an episode. So it kind of happened very impromptu. You <laughs> see me here. But, uh, Can we rotate it so you're in there? I don't want to be the star of the show here. I'm the host, so you're the star. Okay, let's do that. There we go. Cool. Perfect. Actually, no, I'm going to actually even give you a shout out in the comments so people join. Sure. Uh, do you, so do you City of Podcasts? City, City of Champions. Champions. Yeah. City of Champions. On iTunes. Or uh, Google Play Store. Okay. Do you do live stuff all, often? I try to. Yeah. Um, I'm not very. I don't always remember. So when I do, <laughs> I make sure I just uh, I dial it in. So. It's always that fine balance of like wanting to stay in the moment and giving it your full attention, but also yeah. knowing like, hey, promotion wise, like long term wise, this is actually a benefit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus, yeah, there's there's people that you know tune in and. You know, if they like what they hear, they, they, they listen. If they don't, they, they just sign off. So yeah. I think at the end of the day, content now is, is king. And if you can produce good stuff, kind of like you're doing, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it has such a long-term impact. And mm-hmm. it's unfortunate that a lot of people aren't, they don't see the opportunity in it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially if, if it's just as simple as creating a very, you know, a little bit more structure to their social media or, you know, to their to the content that they post, whether they're a good writer or a good photographer or whatnot, like... It does go a long way now, especially in this this world that we live in, where you can identify people that can help you, or mm-hmm. people that you can help, or you can find your tribe. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's really. I think it's really beneficial. So, I mean, that's why I was really, um, I was really happy to, to to do this with you. I think yeah. so it's really cool. Well, uh, it's not a zero sum game out there, right? Like everyone can win. We can all we can exactly. all build off each other's success. Um, and I think everyone's got a story. That's what's so interesting about mm-hmm. this. And I try and say, like, if, if someone seems uninteresting, it's just because you're not a- asking the right questions. Mm-hmm. Like, when you really do a deep dive into anyone's life and, like, all the events that have led up to make them who they are, even if seemingly on the outside, they're not, you know, not someone who's doing it all, you yeah. know? There, there's, you know, still waters run deep. So I think the other side of that spectrum, too, is that some people aren't good at storytelling. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. even something that I, try, I struggle with on a, on a daily basis, whether, you know, you're even something as simple as writing an email or if you're producing a, a blog or if you got a pitch to prospective partners or even if you a, a marriage proposal is a form of a, <laughs> a storytelling yeah. a opportunity, right? And it's something that I think different individuals are more privileged to have maybe the, the language barrier not in front of them or, mm-hmm. or whatever the case is. But I think it's such an important asset and mm-hmm. something that people should practice on 
a daily basis because it's one of those things that will never go away. I think you're always telling your story. You're always mm-hmm. pitching yourself. You're always trying to get that job, get that girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case is, right? So. Yeah. So what what are the events that have kind of led you to where you are today? I, yeah. I, I you know, lots of people you can kind of give a couple headers to and say, yeah, they do this or they, they do that or this is their job. But with you, sorry, you know, you do a lot of different things. Um, and so what are sort of the, the, the key highlights, the touch points that you would say describe you in a couple sentences? Wow, in a couple sentences. Um, well, I, I would say that basketball and sports has, have been a really strong anchor for getting me to, or to, to help me achieve what I have achieved, um, as well as my, my, my parents. My, my parents, they, they came up in very humble beginnings, um, you know, being born and raised in, in Sierra Leone, which is still one of the most impoverished countries in, in the entire world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of knowing that that is where I'm from, it's really kind of, I feel privileged in the fact that I, I have been given the opportunity to grow up in a, in a place like Canada. Yeah. Were you born there? Or you I was born there. Yeah. Why did you go to Canada? I moved here when I was three years old. Yeah. So I, I don't remember too much, but at the same time, I have a, a little bit of a responsibility to, you know, it's kind of like you're almost that golden child per se, right? And yeah. Not that in the sense that I've been given a, a silver platter, but in the sense that there's not very many people that, that make it out of that, that, that district and yeah. can can have the opportunity to, to give back, right? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think definitely my parents and, and where I'm from and my 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 love for sports has definitely got me to, to kind of where I am. Yeah. So you do you remember much of Sierra Leone, like from when you were I don't remember no? much, no. So at what point growing up did you realize that you had this whole, did you go from like an Edmonton-born kid and you're like, oh, I'm from Edmonton, to realizing you've got this whole like unique cultural lineage mm. that that took place before your memories kind of kicked in and that you and then you obviously feel a little bit of responsibility to you know do do that country proud or do your you know your ancestors proud yeah that's that's a really good question and I, I don't know if I can really nail a good answer to that yet um, other than the fact that I've always been a risk taker mm-hmm. um, I've always looked at situations in a way where you know if there's a million and one reasons as to why something won't work um, it's up to you to find that one reason as to why it will work. And, you know, from the odds of it, it sounds like it's very risk savvy, but you actually put your, you, you frame your mindset to be a little bit more um, risk mitigating, mm-hmm. right? Where you can forecast things, but at the same time, you don't deal with things until you get there, right? Mm-hmm. I think why people are, are afraid to maybe j- take that leap from that job or, you know, not try out for that sports team is because they will give themselves the million and one reasons as to why it will not work. Right. When realistically, there's only going to be one scenario, and that scenario is the one that uh, the universe wants to create for you, or that on the opposite opposite side of that spectrum, you put into that universe. Mm -hmm. So, And I say that because... um, I look back as to where my parents came from and the history and the ancestry that I have in my family and I look at that as the greatest risk risk of all yeah. right bearing everything on the line you know not knowing where you're bringing your kids to this place called Canada coming in the middle of February in 1994 <laughs> and straight to Edmonton straight to Edmonton that's a right? bad time to come to Edmonton <laughs> uh, we, actually, we moved to Devon right yeah um, and I mean, I'm like, okay, well, if my parents can survive years of civil war, mm-hmm. you know, putting their family on a, on a plane and, and moving to Canada where they knew no one and nothing to get to where they are at right now with the re- resources that they had. Um, I look at that as my responsibility to provide other people with that opportunity. And mm-hmm. it, that doesn't always mean other people from where I'm from. But even there's there's people here that suffer from the mental barricade that they, they place on themselves, right? Yeah. So if, if I could help one more person to think a little bit differently and mm-hmm. help them get to where, where they want to be, I, I think that's very powerful. I think that's one of the biggest human gifts that we have. 100%. And it, that strikes such a chord with me because working in an office, working a normal day job for so many years, like I would see people in their 30s, 40s, 50s that like 
they're doing the same job they've done for the last 10 or 20 years and and you know I'm not trying to judge them but like you just don't seem happy like you're bitter you're kind of you coming to work is just like part of the routine and it's like how's your day it's like oh it's a day <laughs> it's like that's just it, to me like there seems like there's so much more but I completely understand the risk aversion we're programmed that way biologically yep. to to you know fear loss more than we appreciate gain yep. and and so it totally makes sense so um at what point growing up, like, did you decide, like, I'm, I'm going to pursue this non-traditional route of going to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to start my own business versus, like, you know, I'm going to go to business school and, and then join a big company? Uh, well, you know what, I, I've always wanted to be, I guess, uh, a money guy, right? And What not- do you mean? Like a, a rich guy? A rich guy. Okay, right? that's fair. And, and not in, like, the snobby rich sense, and mm-hmm. not to, just for the fact of having money but you know I, I I look at money I think a little bit differently than other people look at it right some people look at it as you know maybe like, maybe like storage of value maybe you can buy more things maybe you know uh, th- there's a more of a net worth to your name uh, I just look at money as having economic opportunity mm-hmm. right and if someone doesn't want to give you that economic opportunity or if you're not in a position to take that economic opportunity then you have to go and create it yourself and and that's if you really boil it down to the empirical reason of what money is um, it's just being able to transfer economic opportunity so one thing I'll touch on towards the latter is you know I think there's three very vital stages in life first stage being learning second stage being earning and third stage being returning which is giving back and if you can put yourself in a situation where you can optimize each of those stages in your life, it will only let you um, expand or I guess grow into the next stage that more easy, right? Right. When you look at guys like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or you know some of the more successful people that we 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 we, we we've known in our time. What are they spending their resources on now, right? Mm-hmm. It's giving back. They can't give right? it away as fast as it's coming in, even though they try, right? Exactly, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they've really optimized, in a sense, you know, the, the learning phases of their life, the earning phases, and now we're at the, we're at the point where, you know, they're, they're returning an ample amount, right? Mm-hmm. So kind of back to, you know, my lineage and why, why I, I, I try to be as, you know, risk-savvy and, and take, I guess, the hits on, on, on big ideas is... You know, I want to get to that place of returning, um, not as quickly as possible, but I, I want to optimize that part of my life mm-hmm. a, as much as I can. Yeah. I think that's my responsibility to, to my community, to, to my family, to, you know, anyone that has, um, they don't have the same opportunity that, that I do. Right. Um, so before I started business, I was a, uh, I, I, I played basketball. Yeah. You know, I played uh, five years for the University of Alberta, and you know, I thought that I was going to the NBA. Right? That was my form of, you know, uh, optimizing my earning phase and uh, going into my returning phase uh, re- really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't work out. So it was okay. Well, was the next thing? I can either go act. I can, you know, whatever the case is. But you know, being in business really struck uh, a chord with me because I felt that it was something that. I could be one of the best in the world at, mm-hmm. and I think that that's really powerful when, mm-hmm. when you when you find that thing. So explain to me the optimization of the different phases. So, for example, like your learning phase, I can understand that. I, I'd imagine that sort of like bootstrapping as much as you can in terms of like spend as little and and pull in as much as you can information wise. So whether that's like living exactly. with your parents throughout university. You know, if, if they're, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have them pay for it for you, so you don't have to sacrifice time to go work a job to afford university, you can put all your mind into the studying. So I get that part. Mm-hmm. Talk about optimizing the earning phase. How do you do that without being selfish? Like without like just being so like me centric and focused? Well, I, I think back to one of my first points, you know, with, you know, what money actually is, it's, it's just the transfer of economic opportunity. You can only be in a place to transfer economic opportunity if your mind is to offer value into the world, right? So, you know, similar to kind of the platform that you've built here, right? Where, you know, you can connect with 
very influential people from almost a snap of a finger for from a message um, because you've you've built a product or you you've built you know a platform that offers value into the world, right? Not only to the people that you you get a chance to sit down with, but also your your listeners and your audience and stuff, right? So you know if if I mean some of the more successful people I mean yeah they, they could be they could be selfish but at the end of the day they've created something that has offered them the opportunity to offer value into the world mm-hmm. and I think that's the least that's the most selfless thing that you can do right um, and, and and yeah I, I think uh, hopefully that that answers your question yeah uh, I, I don't I don't think that's I, I don't think that's selfish I mm-hmm. think that's that's doing something that um, you, you can look back and be like, I actually, I helped someone. Right. right. So then the earn, the earning and the giving back phase can really, when you get there, it can really overlap, right? Like you can be pulling in and you can be earning, but you can also be offering opportunity to other people, you know, whether they're employees, whether they're people you're helping with the initiatives that are building you up at the same time, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just look, look at the phase as far as like where someone like a Mark Zuckerberg is, or, you know, I, I look up to someone like, like Jay-Z now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's had a very troubled past, but he's gotten to the place in his life where he uses his platform that he's created in his past, where he's earned a lot, mm-hmm. to basically share his message and be a very strong influencer in the community, right? Right. Now he's talking about, you know, his his relationship problems, and now he's talking about the issues he had with his, you know, in his childhood or his, his mom being being gay. And that, I think that's that's way more powerful than the things that he did in his earning phase of his life where he was just right. like rapping and talking about, you know, women yeah. in derogatory terms and stuff. Right. right. Um, and I mean, at the same time, he was connecting with people in, in his in his early fi- in his earning phase. So I, I think it does. Um, you, you do touch on how it does overlap. Um, a, mm-hmm. a little bit there. You brought up a really interesting point about now he's talking about all the issues that people face, and and I think that's a really um, important shift in our culture now. Like I, through a lot of this storytelling I'm doing and learning about people's backgrounds, you see that like a lot of people, say our parents' age, for example, were really afraid to talk about their feelings. There was really that barrier of like, no, you you know, this happens within the family. It's very closed off. But I think like. Me personally, I think I've learned that living life a little bit more vulnerably and open um, and and just being honest, Mm -hmm. like the truth is going to always come out. So why fight it? Why why spend mental energy trying to dance around it? There's a a really good book by Sam Harris called Lying. It's a really short one. It's like 70 pages, but he just talks about how like even little white lies, like just totally destroy your life like they build up walls like one little brick at a time yeah, yeah. and you rob basically the the fundamental belief of it is like you rob other people of your view of the world by lying to them if i tell you a lie you no longer understand me as well as you did before right mm-hmm. so i mean it's um it's it's a really important shift i think to 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 open up yeah. a little bit more so I mean that's beautiful and I, I just I want to add something to, on, on that really quick before you ask, you ask your question mm-hmm. um, you know I think in entrepreneurship and business you know you, you kind of you're treading on a very fine line between selling the vision and almost like drinking your own Kool-Aid yeah, or faking it a little bit yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to gotta, drink your Kool-Aid you right? some of the self-hype yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just even yesterday, I was going back and forth in an email with a you know, prospective partner for, for our festival. And, you know, they, they asked why our sponsorship ask was so high, right? Um, and, you know, I, I just told them, I said, listen, right? You know, you, you were asking for a multi-year partnership deal here with, with our festival, mm-hmm. right? What, what you're going to provide us in the first year is going to be representative of the work that we've done in the past um, and it, it, the, the amount that is provided and the value that we, we return to you is going to reflect that um, but how, how are we going, going to negotiate something in two years from now uh, A, when we haven't accomplished what we want to do next November and we don't have those metrics to look 
look back on, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are trying to build a, a rocket ship and a, and a, a spaceship here. So <laughs> I don't want to lie to you and say that we won't get to where we want to go in an exponential manner. Right. Um, so where do we kind of draw that line between um, me trying to sell this vision mm-hmm. and you know us not being in a position to give you the value that we know that we can create two years from now, right? Because right? I mean, we're, we're seeing that, you know, companies, organizations can basically transform overnight. So I think that's one of the, the ba- battles that I think entrepreneurs or people that are creators or innovators, they, they face on a daily basis. Is underestimating where they can get to. Underestimating where they can get to and speaking things into existence. Right. So where do you draw the line between, oh, you're just a blatant liar and to know, I know that in a year and a half, this is where this organization is going to be, or this right. is how many people we can help. Right. Right. So they, that, that's a really interesting point that I wanted to, to touch on that. Really <laughs> I quick. think it's the tough questions. We'll unearth that pretty quick, right? You just, you dig down like, okay, so tell me why you think you're going to get to that. Or like, what, what's the reasoning? And if, if you hear something that's simply like, well, you know, I, I you know, I anticipate that our numbers are going to go. It's, no, no, that's bullshit. Like, <laughs> well, see, here's the thing: is that like you know we've been trained to be linear thinkers, right? Mm-hmm. You know, since our our human lineage in the earliest of days as humans, we've been trained to grow and think linearly, right? If you wanted to find out information, you know, 200 years ago, you had to walk to your to the to this town or to to your neighbor's house mm-hmm. or something. You know, now we live in a world where we open up our phone and we have all the world's information at our fingertips, mm-hmm. right? If you were to tell someone 10 years ago that social media would be one of the biggest economic, social, and cultural drivers of the world, you know, people would just laugh at you. That was, It was a product made it by college students in right. dorm rooms and stuff, right? Yeah. But now, you know, you can argue to some degree that... The president of the United States is in power because of platforms like Twitter um, that he has at his fingertips, right? Mm-hmm. So we can't we can't estimate where we're going to be in five years, right? Because we're living in this very exponential world where, yeah, you know, think about it. So like ten years ago, twenty years ago, if we count the internet, twenty years ago, we got three fundamental technologies that have completely changed the way that we work, live, and play. Mm-hmm. You know, we got the internet social media we got mobile devices Mm -hmm. right like we cannot picture our lives without those three things like I don't care what kind of person you are you somehow have a tie-in with those three technologies in your life Mm -hmm. or there's people in your life that basically have made a living off those three things right so I think that's kind of one of the one of the things especially when and I think it's a little bit of a Canadian mentality too, is that we're a little bit too scared to, you know, share our audacious ideas with people because mm-hmm. we will be criticized for it not making sense. Well, it's like, well, the last, you know, if you were to look back 10 years, where, how we progress has not making sense. So right. why are we, who's to say that over the next 10 years, things are going to make sense, right? right? So I think that's that's why it's okay to be a little bit audacious and, mm-hmm. you know, not have a reason for your numbers. Yeah. But we're, we're also scared to, like, say an idea out loud or share it or write it down because you ever have this where an idea makes perfect sense in your head and then as soon as you try and articulate it to someone, you're like, well, I just totally lost it. Like, I don't know what I'm talking yeah. about. Like, in your head, for some reason, these mental connections just all clicks. But the second you, like, bring it out, and it goes into people's... Um, they're being afraid to fail, right? To, mm-hmm. you know, so they're like, oh, I'm not, I have this really great idea. And then if someone else ever, ever executes on it, then they're like, oh, I had that idea. It's yeah. like, well, why didn't you do it? Yeah, it's yeah. like the line in social network, right? If you would have invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but I wanted, circling back for one second, I wanted to ask you, other than just saying, oh, don't be afraid to fail, like, you know, don't be afraid to try, like, what can people really do in their in their daily lives and their routines to to start moving from the place of, of stagnation to a place of you know talking things into existence as you said that's a really good question I, I think I mean in my totally biased humble and uninformed and uneducated opinion I think it just comes down to to patience I think you know, I mean, I, I'm 27 years old. I don't think I've accomplished, you know, a quarter of what I want to accomplish in, in my life. But mm-hmm. that still doesn't mean that I can't p- 
put myself in a routine where I'm getting 1% better every single day, right? And I think we live in a, such a fast paced world now that we just, we see the things on social media, we see the fake lifestyles or, or, or portrayals of, 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 of a person that, um, you know, people put up on, on these social platforms and stuff. And we ask ourselves, like, why, why don't we have this? Why, why am I in this situation? Or why am I not as privileged as this individual? Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it just comes down to just really being present and you know, sharing a little bit of humility and empathy for wh where you are and the who the type of person you are. You're, you're a human being, right? You live in Canada. You know, you're able-bodied. Mm -hmm. For myself, <laughs> it's funny. I, I always tell the story. Um, you know, there's times where I'm walking in a in a dark alley, and there's someone coming the other way, and because the person sees that you know, maybe I'm a little bit of darker skin, <laughs> you know, they never, I never get approached. Yeah. I never, like, I've never ran into someone in the alley who mm -hmm. wanted to pick a fight with me. Right. right? And... You're a big guy, too. Yeah, you know, I'm 6'2", six, 6'3", six, have yeah. a big, big frame and stuff. And I, I look at that more of, a, I guess, like a, a blessing than a reason to be like, oh, I'm, I'm black, right? Mm -hmm. Or... Um, people don't like me or people want to avoid me because, you know, of my, my skin tone, right? So there's always ways that we can reframe situations in our head where it always works out to our advantage. Right. Right? Every disadvantage can be an advantage, right? Exactly. The silver lining, the obstacle is the way, that kind of thing, right? And th there's another time I was leaving Nate. I, I had a, a meeting there and I decided to stay to do some work. It was the eve of Halloween. It was very cold outside. Um, and it was about 1.15 a.m. Um, the train, last train came at one eleven. I didn't drive that day. Mm -hmm. So in this train station, it was me and this uh, this other lady. She she walked in. She had those uh, those stilts um, that people like walk in when when their legs aren't aren't capable. Like the hand ones. Hand stilts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so it's me and her, and you know we're calling the the ETS line to see if there's another train coming in, and obviously there isn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cab companies are busy. Uber services are surcharged to the max <laughs> yeah. because it's Halloween. And, you know, it's me and this, me and this, uh, this lady that just was not able-bodied. And mm -hmm. she, fortunately, she called um, somebody to come pick her up. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I wanted to walk. Mm -hmm. So I walked from Nate to White Ave. In about it was about like minus twenty, minus twenty five. I didn't really have a warm winter jacket on, mm -hmm. and you know it, it was cold. But just the humbling fact in that moment that I could consider the fact that I had legs that I could walk from you know an hour and a half distance to get to where I wanted to to get to. Mm -hmm. That was just like a very. That's when it just hit me in, in the sense that like I have you know there's nothing that I can ever be ungrateful for. Yeah. Right. 100 percent man that's so powerful like and not only that you're able to walk but like you're able to walk an hour and a half and not run into someone who's going to kill you who's going <laughs> to exactly. rob you yeah you know like and at any point in that hour and a half you could have popped into like a 7-eleven or tim hortons and and warmed up and exactly. not frozen to death but that's not an option for some people yeah exactly so i mean so i guess so to get back to your question i think um, we we don't display enough empathy we don't display we don't say thank you enough and mm -hmm. we don't we don't, we don't, we, we don't have patience, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want to make it a generational thing, um, whether it's millennial, Gen Z's, Gen X's or whatever. I think just kind of with the people that are on these technology platforms right now, um, we, we don't want to work for the next seven years, invest our whole, you know, heart and mind and soul into something and get that return. We want that immediate instant gratification. Yeah. Right. And I think that just ends up people putting themselves in a vicious cycle where they work that job that they don't want to work or they do the thing that they don't want to do or mm -hmm. they don't put in the extra four hours a day to, you know, build what they want to build because they're just not patient enough. Right. We've been taught that that's the way, right? Like we, you taught that 
work is work and play is play. Like you struggle so that you can afford to do the things you want to do, right? Not realizing that there's an intersection of those two worlds, right? That you mm-hmm. can do something that's a struggle, that's hard work, but you also enjoy it. And yeah, man, just getting back to what you said about the empathy thing, it's it's so hard to rewire the way that we are um, based on our experiences. Like I fucked up yesterday, so I'll tell you the story. So I went to get groceries and I was taking the bus home. And so I had my two bags of groceries like really full and I didn't have any change in my pocket and I knew that. And this guy came up to me and he said, um, could you help me like get some food? Like, could you give me money to get food? And I'm thinking like running through my head, I'm like, okay, like I have like, only have like a 20 on me. And I'm like, oh, do I give him like the 20? And then I saw the bus coming and I was like, shit, I don't have time to like dig out a 20. And like, and then just that like, you're so used to like giving a little bit of change. So I'm like, is 20 like too much to give to someone? I'm like, and so first of all, that is really embarrassing that my mind never even went that way. Like she just given the guy 20 bucks. But I didn't even like think. I'm like, man, I have like bananas in my bag. Yeah. I could have given him a couple of bananas. I'm th- like, I didn't realize that until I got on the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was just so disappointed in myself that I was like, why didn't you like? Why did that make you so uncomfortable? Like mm-hmm. to be approached by another human being in need, and and I blew it. Like I'll be honest. Like yeah. I'm really disappointed in that. Um, and it's it's that feeling of like awkwardness of like that social interaction and and Jesse Lipscomb who I'm sure you know and his make it awkward campaign like we had this discussion a couple weeks ago and I still like it's just I don't know how to like institute that daily how to like Mm. force yourself to 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 do that like and not revert back to your old ways I don't I don't know I I think it's uh you know comes back to that underlying tone that it's just it requires patience right it's not something that happens overnight we Mm -hmm. weren't you know you know we've been grown up we've been raised in society to think that you know homeless people they are unworthy or you know they made mistakes in their lives that they don't deserve a second chance mm-hmm. right and you know that's never it never comes out to be like a, a very like overt message but it's something that's stealth in our in our in our society mm-hmm. right so um, I think now that you're aware you know next time maybe the, the next person that you help it might be more than ten dollars, twenty dollars. It might be more than a few bananas because mm-hmm. you know you've had that experience, right? I think we're all we're all, you know, and we're all products of our environment, mm-hmm. right? So um, I, I would look at that as an opportunity to be, you know, even better next time, right? Yeah, I think like to your point about fast-paced life, like we're just so inundated and constantly thinking about the next thing and and in absorbing information. I'm listening to podcasts in my headphones, and you're all like you like. I think it's important to take time to like slow down, reflect, mm-hmm. think about the day. Like, so I journal in the morning and night. I have this thing called the Panda Planner, which is unreal. Like, right. you set your goals for the day and you write your schedule and gratitude in the morning and things you want to improve for the next day. But even that's like become a routine. Mm-hmm. Even that is like okay, quickly like my gratitude. Like, yeah, yeah, my yeah. big things are opportunity, health of my family, and and, yeah. and people who support me. Like those mm-hmm. are things I'm super grateful for. But you know, even that becomes routine. So yeah, I yeah. think it's. You know, I think it's important that people like Jesse and people like what you're doing are really shaking up the fabric of of normal day routine and everyday life. And that's a great segue, if I do say so myself, into asking you about this big new project. Maybe it's not so new to you, but yeah. new to the world um, that you're involved in, the Sea Tribe Festival and that organization. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I guess... Really, really quickly, the the Sea Tribe Festival is um, is a festival that we put together to celebrate creativity and to spark big ideas while um, kind of bringing our community along. So um, it, it it's funny how it's just kind of come about, and it's come about from what I would consider a, a lesson in my life, right? Mm-hmm. So. I mean, my, my background is, is software and, you know, I, we were building a, a product. I'm not a software developer. Let's just clarify that. Okay. I do more like the, the management and right. kind of just like, you know, coining the, the, the decisions as to kind of what the next phases are and stuff. Yeah. Um, and last year around this time, I hopped on a flight to New York. Um, I wanted to ask you about this because you had a face or an Instagram post about this, right? Yeah, all right, I, I did. Tell I us did. the story. Sorry, to yeah, no, no problem. Uh, so I, I got on this flight. You know, we were kind of on our last leg. We we raised uh, friends and family around that summer, um, and uh, 
you know, we, we had some money to do some product development and, you know, about January, we were just kind of on, on our last leg of what, what we, what we, what we had. And, um, this is for a business or is this for the festival? So this was for a, a product that we were developing called capsule. Okay. So what capsule is or was, or still alive, it's tabled somewhere. Okay. Um, it's basically, it is a digital community for video recommendations. So, you know, if you were to think of what Yelp and Vine would look like combined, gotcha. you know, that, that's what Capsule would be. Right. Um, so, you know, we had this grand vision of being the next, you know, Yelp for video content and, and whatnot, right? Um, uh, long story short, we, we didn't get into the accelerator program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you being the leader, the CEO, the person that was supposed to come home and, you know, bring the bread back with you, per se, and, you know, raise, raise capital, get into the accelerator program and whatnot, you know, I, I, I failed at it, right? Um, and when I when I came home, I you know couldn't pay people that month. I had to lay people off. Um, I mean, it was a really really um, bad time, or I guess like you know very very sad time in, in my life. Right? Why did you not get in? We were too early. Too early. Our product was too early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have the traction, um, and and yeah. I mean, I think it's it's amongst other things and stuff, but uh, I think at the end of the day, we were just we were just too early. Okay. Um, so, but when I was in New York, so I spent about six weeks in New York, and I participated in this event called Founders Friday. And basically, what it was, it was an opportunity for an um, uh, individual to host a live Q and A like this. Mm -hmm. um, there were maybe about like fifty to sixty people that would attend in, in a viewing audience. And you know you got to connect with people, or you got to hear interviews with people from New York that were, you know, they were really good in tech, or they were really good in fashion, or in, in media, or whatnot. So really, just like very successful, well accomplished people, or people that were emerging, right? And you know, if if you've ever been into New York, that says something for the region because that's where a lot of things kind of happen. Oh yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I really consider it as kind of like the the mecca of the world. But so every every Friday morning, I would wake up. Uh, I mean, getting around in New York is super super hard, especially for a first timer. Mm -hmm. Especially when you live in a city that only a train <laughs> only goes north and south. That stop at one a.m. and then you have to walk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, their train system is like really robust, and you know, you you if you want to make it from one end of the of, of a city to the other, you're spending like two hours on a train. So every morning, I was up at like six a.m. to make it for this eight o'clock. Uh, Founders Friday live Q&A um, and it wasn't necessarily the the content that was really just like inspiring to me I mean it was just content that you could find on like let's say a blog yeah. or a, you know a video or whatnot mm -hmm. but it was really the the diversity in the room that really struck me as to um, as to like this was something that I really wanted to be part of right? the, the people in the crowd or the people exactly. performing yeah the, the people in the crowd okay I mean afterwards after like the Q&A would take about an hour mm -hmm. and afterwards you'd have an opportunity to walk around the room and stuff and you know you'd see people that are like they were in you know New York Fashion Week or they were Fortune 500 managers of some of the biggest brands or sorry not they were uh, brand managers for Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. or they were like tech nerds that have raised you know X amount of millions of dollars for, for their companies or you know just like pe there were people who like worked on Wall Street on, in the financial district right yeah and like to for someone from Edmonton Alberta to go to a city like this and see you know all these people that you read about and heard about in like you know blogs and like TV shows and stuff it was really really eye-opening for me right right but what was what also struck me was just the amount of collaboration that they would like delve into right so they would talk about not only their projects but also projects that they would want to work on with other people in the room right mm -hmm. and I mean I remember one time there was um, a photographer talking to to a model and the photographer's like hey I'm shooting Vogue in a couple months you know can you be in it yeah. uh, you know we were looking for for one more roster spot and like right there you know that's you know if that's not a few hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollar deal kind of produced right on the spot yeah and it's in one of the biggest publications that's known kind of like worldwide right mm -hmm. so there's like so much collaboration had she not like, gone that day she would have missed a big opportunity then yeah and you know it, it just really struck to you that like that's why it was so important to put yourself in those scenarios to you know to, to find that success right or to find yeah. those opportunities and stuff but or more importantly 
um, um, uh, you know, celebrate diversity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and coming back to, to, to Alberta, I was, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I was a little bit sad because A, I ran out of money, B, I had to come home to lay off my staff, and C, I was leaving such a strong ecosystem, right? right. And, you know, for someone like myself, who I find to be, you know, I, I think that it's my my personality and my ability to connect with people, that's one of my strongest, you know, uh, you know, strengths that I have, yeah. you know, to leave such a, you know, a, a ecosystem like that was, was really frustrating, right? But instead of complaining about it, you know, I turned it into an opportunity to, you know, hopefully create something similar here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where the Sea Tribe Festival was born. So mm -hmm. I remember it was about February 4th, I landed, for about a week, I was really, really, you know, I, I don't want to use the word depression because I never, I was never like clinically di diagnosed for it. So I don't think that's fair to right. people who actually suffer from that. But yeah. I was really, really just down and like my, 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 my parents could see it. My girlfriend at the time could see it. Mm -hmm. Um, and for about a week, I just, I stayed in bed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my girlfriend would wake, would wake up in the morning and she would go to, she would go to school at the time and. Um, I wouldn't get up until like noon, right? Um, and it wasn't until like a week and a half later, I was like, you know what? I gotta, I, I can't live like this anymore. I gotta do something. I gotta do something, right? Yeah. And kind of back to my point, I wasn't a software developer, so I couldn't work on the product that we, we, we wanted to build. So I was like, okay, I had to audit my skill sets, right? I had to look at the things that I was good at and the value that I could bring to people, right? So... For about two and a half months from there, I was, you know, building websites. I was like creating pitch decks. I was reaching out to prospective partners, speakers, um, you know, attendees and stuff. And you know, uh, I, I would say for about two and a half months, you know, I put together this thing that was called Capsule Tribe. Yeah. Um, and you know, it was a derivative of the Capsule product. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, in May of May twenty fourth of two thousand seventeen, it turned out to be this. 200 person festival with 12 speakers two of them being from new york and a full day worth of experiences and stuff mm -hmm. um and it was really really beautiful to kind of see it come together right so let me get this straight from uh pseudo depression in february and failure to may so basically four months you put together this like pretty decent little festival thing yeah, that's and, some good accomplish. That's some good rebound. And don't get me wrong, right? Like at the time, um, kind of early May, you know. So I, I made the conscious decision that, okay, I, I don't want to run into the situation where I bring people on board and a they quit too early, mm -hmm. or b you know we can't deliver on what we want to deliver. So I was like, for up until early May, I'm going to just put all my effort uh, into this and not use anyone else's help. It's mm -hmm. kind of counterintuitive of, you know. I guess this collaboration idea, but yeah. it was kind of like a commitment that I, I made to myself. So from about May onwards, I did have um, help volunteers that came on board, you know, good friends or, mm -hmm. you know, people that saw kind of what we wanted to create and stuff. And don't get me wrong, we, we sold, I sold the shit out of it. You know, I said <laughs> that the best speakers were going to come and, yeah. you know, we, we did have a really strong speaker lineup, but uh, for some of the speakers that we, we wanted, uh, one lady, her name was... Um, Emma, I forgot her last name, but she was the youngest person to ever take a company public in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, very successful uh, woman entrepreneur, um, and you know she had a really strong message as to why it was so important for for women to be in positions of like leadership and stuff, right? Yeah. And you know we we were very close to bringing her. We had her speaker fee. I was going to put it on my my credit card. <laughs> you know, was going to pay for her flight. She was in London. Yeah. Um, and when we were about to book our flight, she was like, oh, I only fly first class. <sighs> so, double, double the price, right? Well, it was, I mean, it was about, I think it was about 1200 bucks. I think a first class flight was about $4,000. Oh, so shit. it was really, really expensive. Yeah. So now I had to go back to my partners and the people who had bought tickets to come hear this lady speak to be like, how old is she? She's just shy of 30. Man, she got fancy quick, eh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 First class. <laughs> All right. But, so, I mean, hey, I mean, it's, that's, that's what, <laughs> it's funny, for our next festival coming up in November, mm -hmm. now that we have the resources, yeah. um, you know, uh, I'm reaching out to her again to, uh, to actually, you know, stomach her first class flight, her speaker fee, and right. you know, give her actually a bigger stage to yeah. speak on, right? So, it's funny how, like, work that you put on, 
or maybe that you consider yourself failing at in the in the past, mm-hmm. you can kind of compound it and yeah. you know learn from it and grow from it, right? Yeah. So yeah, so you know, uh, we now kind of grew up to next November. We were having a, a four-day festival, mm-hmm. um, and it's capped off by a, a, li- a live fashion show uh, mm-hmm. because it's our belief that it's arts and culture that really bring the community together. And if we really want to bring innovation to underrepresented communities, you know, I think that Edmonton is a highly underrepresented community in the innovation ecosystem. Mm-hmm. You know, if we really want to bring people out in the droves that I know we can bring them out, mm-hmm. you know, we have to use an experience, an event that already has like a mental mind map in their heads, right? right. It's not talk about blockchain or artificial intelligence or you know smart cities or all this new tech. It's connecting with the arts arts community, mm-hmm. right? And it's connecting with art artistic events that people are already they want to attend right Mm -hmm. Um, so this was the hypothesis that we had since our very first event and what happened is if you look at our full day of programming we had you know from about 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. we had speaker series right so those speakers were talking on you know some of the topics like smart cities and artificial intelligence and clean energy and all that sort of stuff where was the conference was it at City Hall uh, so it was actually it ha- our first one happened at Garneau, yeah. Garneau Theater, yeah. um, and uh, and we kind of we, we bounced around the city. After Garneau, we had a little mini lunch experience at uh, the Needle Tavern, actually, which yeah. just closed here. Um, then we had a mass meditation series because kind of back to one of your first points as far as like being present and mm-hmm. to really to really identify some of those opportunities in your life, you have to be able to connect your mind, body, and spirit. So we we took everyone for a break. Uh, for, for a meditation series in the Epcor Tower, which nice. is one of the, the bigger buildings or bigger towers here. And then we, we finished things off with a fashion show. Yeah. So we had kind of like a full day worth of experiences for people here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the hypothesis that we set was that, okay, if we can create an event that already has a mental mind map in people's heads, then it's easy for us to convert them to some of the more important pressing topics that we want them engaged with and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So that important or that mental mind map event was a fashion show. Right. And all, I mean, we were sold out. You know, we had over 200 people that showed up for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happened is the people that attended the full day, mm-hmm. like we only had about 60 to 80 people that attended from like 9 a.m. to like after party at 11 p.m., <laughs> right? But they talked to people who only attended the fashion show. Yeah. And they were like, Hey, you know what? Like this event is great. Like this, like fashion show is awesome. It's fun. There's drinks, trendy outfits, and stuff. Yeah. But you missed out on what happened. Right. In with the morning and the, the talks and yeah. you know the the speakers. Real meat and stuff. potatoes of it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So what kind of you know when we spun out our November event last last November, you know we saw a, a higher amount of people show up for like the speaker stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of like our, our hypothesis was was realized, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean that that was really powerful. So yeah, that's kind of what the the Sea Tribe Festival is. I think I, I jumped around a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah. I, I want to ask you how do you how do you reduce the how do you dial back people's self consciousness? Because anyone who's not in the artistic world or, or you know the fashion world, those can be really intimidating um, cultures to sort of waltz into. Especially if you're like someone's, but oh, I'm bringing you to a fashion show. Like if someone invited me to a fashion show, I'm like pretty open to most things, but I would still be like. Like you see what I'm wearing, man. Like I got like a champions like like sweater you on. Got like, your I, on yeah, like I'm not a fashion guy by any means, and I I'd be fine and open to it. But a lot of people would kind of be like, I don't know, like it's not my world. I'm uncomfortable. So how do you, how do you reduce? And I mean that's a, that's a broader question than specifically to your event. How do you reduce and dial back that self consciousness to new experiences and even like socializing? A lot of people have social yeah. anxiety, right? Yeah. Like, it sounds great in theory to go to a room and network and talk to people and collaborate, but the reality is a lot of people are self-conscious, me yeah. included. Like, yeah. I, I have a tough time approaching a group of four strangers and being like, hi guys, like, how are you doing? My name's Shane. What are you guys up to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it goes back to that, like, we're so concerned about how other people view us. Mm-hmm. What, what are your strategies there? Well, back to your, fa- to start with your fashion point, um, I, I think this is a really important message because... We've been trained as a society to think that fashion is only for the elite Mm -hmm. or fashion is only for people who have fashionable sense per Mm -hmm. se, right? I mean, I I modeled for about eight years and I I modeled with with an agency and there's a really messed up story um, around that as to why I'm not with them anymore. 
Uh, I mean, you know, we did awesome work together. I was really happy with, you know, kind of the career that they helped me build in, in, in the fashion industry. But, you know, I think similar to a lot of institutions that are around us, you know, if you think of the educational institution, if you think of um, the governmental institution, if you think of, you know, the fashion institution or the Hollywood institution, you know, that kind of like elitism is not surviving anymore, mm -hmm. right? Look at kind of what the Me Too campaign has done to like the biggest fashion elites in the world. Or look at kind of what um, platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime are doing to Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? It's becoming very decentralized, digitized, and democratized, right? And I think the fashion institution is the same way. Right now, there's two billion people on the internet. Right, and if if you quantify that, or if you compare it to how many people there are in the world, to the 7.1 billion people that are in the world, you know it's not a very big amount. But you're seeing people create their own fashion sense, or become fashion bloggers, or choose their own outfits, create a, an audience of even if it's like a thousand members, mm -hmm. and now they're becoming coined fashion influencers. Mm -hmm. Right, this did not happen. 10 years ago when it was only the Vogue's or the Sports Illustrated that you had to get published in, right? Right. So now we're seeing like such a decentralization of industries and it's only going to accelerate as we kind of look at what's happening in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So in the future, companies like Google, Tesla, Apple, and Facebook, they're all working on technologies that are going to bring the remaining 5 billion people on the earth, mm -hmm. uh, from on the earth onto the oh, internet. Man. Yeah. So if you really think of how powerful that is, if you never considered yourself like a fashion buff per se, mm -hmm. you know, now if you can find a thousand people in the world that align with your fashion trend mm -hmm. and you can be an influencer to them, well, what is fashion? Fashion is just the ability to sell something to another person, right? right? To sell Story clothes telling. to Back another to person. You're talking about. Storytelling, visualization, yeah. right? You know, I can find people that dress look like me, and I can be an influencer in their world, mm -hmm. and that that's that's what fashion is, mm -hmm. right? So, I guess back to your question as to, you know, the self consciousness. I think it's just like looking at it from a very like macro perspective. Is that um, fashion is whatever you coin it to be? It's your own expression of self, right? And it's your own ability to express that or share that with others mm -hmm. in the hopes that they will buy that product. And if we look at kind of wh where the world is going, I think it should be the biggest opportunity for people who never consider themselves fashionable before to look at it and be like, well, I can go out and I can find my tribe. Mm -hmm. I can find my own audience that I resonate with and I can become this fashion influencer, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to being human. Mm -hmm. If you wear clothes, if you can sell stuff, it's it's it's, it's just comes down to being human, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't want to make it like too simplified because I, I understand that I come from a place of privilege being in the fashion world for the last eight years, but I think it's really powerful as to kind of consider where the world is going and the the things that we have at our fingertips and. Um, it's okay to walk into that event and have the self-confidence that you are a fashionable person because right. at the end of the day, it's just how you express yourself. Right. I'm in a unique situation where I, I don't know what I would call bare minimum fashion sense. Like I, I like, I want to like dress to the bare minimum of like contextually, I will fit into the situation that I go into. Right. Like you don't want to show up to a black tie event in a sweater, like, <laughs> but you know, you also, anyway, it's just, to me, it's like, it's an afterthought. It's just like, okay, what do I need to wear to like, not be like standing out in this event? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, you know, back to sort of the broader question of like that self-consciousness and like how do you how do you make your event more palatable to the average introvert to the average shy person the person who's not necessarily comfortable talking in a group because i agree collaboration is so important and mm -hmm. and just by having these kind of conversations that i have with people it's amazing the opportunities that have come out of it and you know mm -hmm. it just 
that's so vital. But there's so many people who are just too in their own head to yeah. do that. So yeah. what are your recommendations for reducing that barrier? Yeah, so we, we try to... Uh, we're at 20%. We're done. I got a cord if you want. Do you? Yeah. Okay. How can I reach out to a large crowd and not feeling... Oh, we got some questions. We do got some awesome. questions. <laughs> Uh, you mind plugging one of those lights yeah, for the top that. one? Thanks, dude. I yeah, appreciate that. no problem. How many people we got? Let's see here. For my Ooh. podcast listeners who aren't on video, <laughs> sorry, he's got his Facebook Live going, and we've got an audience here. Oh, my tech is ancient now. We got three it people viewing. Hey three guys, people. Hey fellas and ladies. Do you guys? Do you want to do a really quick tidbit as far what the uh, what the podcast is about? Just really quick for the yeah. people that missed it at the start. Yeah, for the people that missed it at the start, I do a podcast called City of Champions. It's really about celebrating the amazing people that we have in this city. Um, the you know the underlying arts and sport and business community. Um, it's it's an opportunity for me to meet amazing people and for amazing people that I have on the show to reach out to a broader audience. I like providing people like yourself a platform to talk to people in a longer format conversation more than just a Snapchat video or an Instagram story that really gets people um, knowing you and understanding what you're about. Um, at first, I thought this podcast was about me and what I wanted to do and then I realized after I got guests coming back to me and saying thank you so much for allowing me to talk to the people in my life in a longer format um, and I realized okay it's kind of more about them mm -hmm. so so I'm, I'm happy to do that and I enjoy it so selfishly it's good for me too yeah exactly and I think the byproduct is um, you know you will see that by you putting out value to the world, it will come back to you in you know an abundant factor in ways that you won't even imagine. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's the humbling part of doing something like this too. Um, but I guess like back to your question as far as you know what kind of things can we do to kind of break down those barriers and allow more introverted people to um, you know see the same opportunities as maybe like extra extroverted people yeah. per se within our events so we, we do a couple of things um, you know you know if you look at kind of like the full four days of our programming you know especially for kind of what we want to do for November and I mean it's a little bit audacious but for our main stage speaker series you know we, we want some fairly high re highly regarded people that we, we kind of have come in for the event so you know, we put out a, a request for proposal for Jessica Alba to be one of the people that we do a live Q and A with. Mm -hmm. um, there's a late, there's a dude named uh, David Sheridan who's actually from Edmonton, uh, moved to San Francisco. Uh, but before he moved to San Francisco, he was rejected from the U of A. <laughs> somehow got into Stanford, and so <laughs> David Sheridan, and get this, he actually ended up being the very first person to write a hundred thousand dollar check to Google. So cool. now that check of $100,000 has afforded him a $4 billion net worth. Um, and he's, yeah, he's David kinda, Sheridan? David Sheridan. And he's from Edmonton. He's from Edmonton. And I only found out about him only about like two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I got so, my next target for my podcast. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Uh, I think he's listed on Forbes, like, you know, top 100 successful or gotta have lofty people. goals man that's right that's right so i mean yeah i mean back to your point like i think we, we uh we, we're really reaching out to you know very successful um people who we think will appeal to a, a broader range of, of individuals another person that we, we we've reached out to is, is gary vaynerchuk right yeah so starting off with our main stage um we're gonna flow into uh a, a vip or sorry a a reception um, kind of meet and greet after. For, yeah, for so all the start with the presentation, yeah. then flow to the reception. Yeah, and then the next morning, um, we're going to give people, a group of 40 people, to join us for meditation. Mm -hmm. So because we go from like macro to like small scale and allow people to kind of, maybe they, they notice someone in the crowd that they want to connect with, yeah. and we kind of create these little breakout sessions for people to maybe have a little bit more of an intimate conversation or yeah. to, you know, feel more comfortable being being approached or approaching other people, yeah. right? If you're in a group of 10,000 people, you know, you're, you're really intimidated by just, like, what's around you. But once you kind of break out mm -hmm. to these, like, little mini, um, 
you know, sessions, mm -hmm. you know, that's your opportunity to, to connect and I think feel comfortable with, with doing that, right? Yeah, I think there's um, a des desensitization there too. You're in a group of a thousand and then all of a sudden you're in a group of five. That feels a lot more comfortable, right? Exactly, yeah. Instead of being just yourself, walking into a group of five unknowns, then you're you're not set at that. You're set at yourself. You're not set at yeah. one thousand people. Exactly, exactly. And you know, we, we do the same thing. So we're we're gonna take people on a on an innovation ecosystem tour. So um, you know, we're gonna have a few buses that are going from places like uh, the U of A to Stantec to. Uh, oh, it's done. Let me see if I can put it on again. They put a limit on your life? Maybe. <laughs> What's your time like, by the way? I want to be respectful. Uh, I, gotta be, uh, I, I have an 11 o'clock. Okay, perfect. Yeah. We'll wrap up in the next 10 minutes here. Okay, wow. It's already been 10 minutes. It's already been it's 10 an, hour? It's 1040 right now. Oh, shit. Yeah, I know, man. You get into these things. And, like, it's funny when I started. I was like, yeah, maybe twenty minutes, half an hour. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. just that's when you start hitting your stride. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Uh, I'll see if I can stick around for a little bit longer. <laughs> All right. um, yeah. So then we, uh, we we do things like these innovation tours, where like groups of you know thirty to forty people will be able to hop around, you know, from like the U of A's to the Nates to the Jobbers to the Stantex. You know, to the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institutes, to the Deep Minds and stuff, mm -hmm. to really see that we have a strong innovation ecosystem kind of happening here, right? And kind of in those in those like scenarios, when you're with some or a group of people for an hour or an hour and a half, and it's a small a smaller intimate intimate group, it kind of gives you the opportunity to smart those uh, those smaller conversations and to maybe you know um, you know have it expand into a, a more of so what do you do? What brings you here? That sort of thing, right? Yeah. And then we the have, icebreakers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we'll have like a VIP dinners as well or uh, kind of like breakout dinners where we'll sit, you know, five or six people around the table, uh, people from different different backgrounds, even people who we feel might benefit each other from just knowing each other, right? Mm -hmm. It works beautifully in our last event where, um, you know, from uh, from our, our, our VIP dinner, we had a, a breakout session um, for topics on like artificial intelligence the next day. So we had our speakers who were, um, you know, you know, prominent in AI, whether if they worked for uh, for for Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute or whether they worked for Hendrix AI. Mm -hmm. And then we, we we paired them up with like guys that worked for like PCL or, or Clark Builders right. or, you know, some of the more traditional um, right. uh, economies that, you know, Alberta so you try You try and cross a little bit in terms of worlds and, and get people that would relate but not are kind of unconventionally related. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. And, you know, from there, it's beautiful kind of what happens afterwards because now... Um, you know, a company like Hendrix AI will do a, so Hendrix AI, what they are is they're, they're a technology that they use um, natural language processing, so just artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. to analyze uh, a meeting. So let's say we're having a meeting, um, we have our, our, our recorder going on, yeah. so it'll be able to summarize the meeting notes to be like, okay, this person said this, this person said this, these are the action items, right. and then afterwards they'll actually email you a, a meeting summary for... Uh, That's wild. It's awesome, right? Yeah. And this is a, a local Edmonton company here, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they're actually, they're doing a beta now, I believe, with like Clark Builders and stuff, right? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, it just kind of came from these inorganic slash organic scenarios we've, we've kind of put people in, right? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, if people are just too uncomfortable, um, you know, there's not much that we can, we can do yeah. from there, right? I think people have to be willing to, you know, break out of their shells and, mm -hmm. you know, be able to, you know, just be welcoming. Because at the right. end of the day, it just comes down to being a human being right. and having the ability to connect with another human being, right? Yeah, I mean, you can lead a horse to water, right? You can't make a drink. That's exactly it. Yeah. So the next event is coming up in November. Is that right? That's right. How do people get involved? How do people find out more information? Um, and what are your what are your sort of like what are your ticketing menu items? Like you can obviously buy the full event. How mm -hmm. how specific can you get? Like, and what do you recommend people attend? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you can just buy one speaker, but you're not going to get the full value, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So, what are your hopes there that people engage with your product? So, we haven't finalized our uh, our schedule yet. We haven't finalized our partnerships or even kind of the the full itinerary. But I think last year. So I guess people can't buy tickets yet, I guess to answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, but what we found, people found a lot of benefit to last year 
was attending a breakout track. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, what I was saying before, a breakout track is your ability to spend three hours to completely just dive into a certain topic of interest. So this upcoming year, we'll have 14 breakout tracks ranging from, like I said, artificial intelligence to blockchain and cryptocurrencies to smart cities to mm -hmm. construction innovation to digital manufacturing, um, do, augmented reality. And do they all have a Edmonton-oriented component to them? Um, or is it more of a global scope? It, it is more global, but we do try and put um, local people as like speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and not all of them, but... Uh, if we have, let's say, four speakers for that day or for that track, mm -hmm. so two industry speakers and then um, a panel of four people that include the two industry speakers from before, yeah. um, you know, we at least have, you know, one or two people that are, are from the local Alberta ecosystem. Um, I, I think that's kind of one of the things that we as an economy, we have to kind of get out of is we've kind of created this velocity where we think that we can only rely on local business or local clientele mm -hmm. right where if we put out a product we only have to sell it to the local Alberta market or just even to the Canadian market or whatever right, right. when realistically we are in a global marketplace now mm -hmm. right so we have to be able to not only compete globally but also market ourselves globally so I think that's why it's important that we bring outside individuals in mm -hmm. and looking kind of what's happening in the ecosystem. Yeah. In terms of attendees, are you hoping people from outside Edmonton come as well? Definitely. What yeah. kind of marketing are you doing? What's the strategy there to attract people here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we're, right now we're working with uh, the uh, Canadian Trade Commissioner. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you can imagine, the Canadian Trade Commissioner, they have offices in different places around the world, whether it be in Asia and, you know, Brazil and Austin, Texas and wherever and they have like um, these these commissioners in in, in, in in different regions and they're really connected to the, like the local business ecosystem there yeah so we will put out like a, a form of a, a welcome advertisement to be like this event is happening right. in, in Edmonton Alberta you know this is why it's going to benefit you as a business XYZ mm -hmm. um, you know this is um, you know and you know this this is what we can offer you as an early bird sale so even for myself I will get those. I will get those um, those invites from the Canadian Trade Commissioner here yeah. to go to those events. So, for example, I'm going to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. Nice. Um, in, in, in March, mm -hmm. um, you know, last 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 month I was in Las Vegas for uh, the Consumer Electronics Show and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can build a robust program and a robust itinerary. And you know, um, give people a reason to come here. Mm -hmm. Then the marketing should han not handle itself, but we have the connections to the local business ecosystems in these different parts of the right. world. So, I mean, that's one of our many marketing strategies that don't include things like digital marketing and you know, all the other stuff that we can do. That's so interesting. It's so applicable to to a global scope of marketing any product, right? Like, or any service or any opportunity. Like, sometimes you just need to put things out in the world and you have no idea who's out there at this point just looking for something. A business exactly. could be like, man, I want to do something, mm -hmm. but I just don't know what that is. Or someone's looking for an opportunity and, and all of a sudden yours comes floating in front of them and they just yeah. attach to it, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's awesome. I think yeah. what you're doing is great. I think it's so fantastic that you saw a an ecosystem in New York that you loved and resonated with and, and you're like, hey, I want to bring that home. Yeah, definitely. I, I, th I think it's, it's a really fantastic opportunity for the city and, and I know I'm really regretful that I missed the first one but I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to this year and, and, yeah. and what you do with it yeah and I mean like don't get me wrong like you know it's just like you know, I was watching this video one time and it's actually a gentleman named Sean Canungo um, I don't know if you he'll ever watch this but I have it on my on, on my Instagram what up Sean so he's a uh, you know a, a guy who did consulting at Deloitte for 12 years he's turned to, out to be like this prolific speaker and he travels all around the world world doing speaking series and stuff and, you know, he was doing this one talk that was talking about, okay, you know, 200 years ago, I'm with my friends and they asked me, Sean, you know, you lived in the year 2018, you know, what can we build so that we can, uh, you know, we can be successful, you know, now, but knowing what's coming in, in the future, right? Right. So he's like, well, you know, we got to build uh, the iPhone. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, okay. So what, what are the starting points? Yeah. So, all right, well, you know, we got to build this thing called the internet. 
then we got to get all these semiconductors put together then you know blah 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 so it just it basically just talks about how like things that have already been established mm-hmm. um, have provided opportunities for guys like yourself for myself to create a platform right yeah. you know the podcast would not be you know available if you know we didn't have the technology or hardware to build you know mics or if we didn't have networks like Google Play and, um, and iTunes to put our, our product on right? right so it's all a, a byproduct as far as like things that have happened in yeah. the past it's called ratcheting up society right like every, yeah. every generation of human beings we build on the past standing on the shoulders of giants exactly so, yeah. right and I mean thankfully there's already been a very strong ecosystem that has been built here mm-hmm. um, that people don't even realize um, you know even the fact that a company like Google will come here and set up shop and name it DeepMind and hire some of the best researchers from the U of A mm-hmm. or you know we have the startup Edmontons or the tech Edmontons in our in our backyard and stuff right so real, real, realistically we're really just building off of the work that these strong organizations that have already done, mm-hmm. our government has already done, you know, our citizens that have already put in the work, um, and, you know, we're, we're just kind of building in, 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 in kind of an additional platform here, right? right. So And that, that gratitude, man, like, we get, it's so, it's so easy to just take that stuff for granted, right? Yeah. And, like, all the work that's been done, not only by the people in this city, but civilization before us, and it's, it's really hard, too, to... Once you know something, to to imagine what it's like to not know that, yeah, right. Exactly. So so you know you take for granted so easily. Just yeah. like, you know, oh yeah, I was trying to think the other day. Like, when did I first? What year was it that I first realized you could just Google something? You could just yeah. type in your search bar, like right? you know, who is the president of the United States in nineteen. 19- 40, you know, or, <laughs> or, you know, like how many scoops, how many cups in, in a, you know, in a pot, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can't remember. I can't recall when, what yeah. year that was the first thing. Was it high school for me? Was it 07, 05 or 06 or, or when? Yeah, and, yeah. and then it's like, what did I do before that? Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to not take for granted. It's hard not, it's hard to be continually grateful for all the things that have been done before. But, uh, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's an eye to the past, but also an eye to the future and, and looking forward to, to building on top of that and making exactly. something that lasts and impacts people. And if you can make a net impact on, on all the people in your network, well, that puts them in a better position to positively impact everyone in their network. Exactly. And it's a, it's a quick multiplier effect there. Well, I mean, just, I mean, back to your point uh, in terms of like, um, you know, gratitude and just that multiplier effect. And I look at it as more of a marginal gain, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, back when I, I was starting, luckily I, I I graduated college and I put myself in a position where I could afford a three thousand dollar flight room and conference ticket to you know a, a big event in you know San Francisco or New York, and that's what really got me inspired to to build software, right? Mm-hmm. And then you know maybe my friends couldn't afford that or my you know people in my network or even you know bring it back people in Africa couldn't afford that right mm-hmm. so I think what's really powerful about what we're doing with bringing innovation to underrepresented communities um, is yeah you know we want the people that can afford the three thousand dollar conference ticket or the hotel or the or the flight or whatnot mm-hmm. um, but a we're not pricing ourselves in, in that market and B um, we believe in the in the idea of like marginal gain, right? So to get me inspired now about like developing more technology, mm-hmm. it's like you're only going to get a little bit of a marginal gain because right. maybe I'll create one more product or, you know, I'll do one more thing that will, you know, create value for society, mm-hmm. right? But if you get someone who didn't know what technology is, didn't know what innovation is, or more importantly, didn't know that they had an opportunity to change their life, their family's life, and the people around them um, using technology and stuff. And you, if you showed them a path or you inspired them to to, to do that, mm-hmm. the marginal gain that you get from for, from doing that is, is a, a bigger multiplier, mm-hmm. right? Compared to, let's say, myself, who I'm already kind of in this world, right? Right. The best example is I, I take the, uh, the oil and gas worker, right? I mean, oil and gas, we've seen, I've seen some of my friends go from making $120,000 a year to almost living below the poverty line. Yeah. And, you know, we're still kind of fighting off 
you know, fighting for this like resource that realistically the world doesn't want anymore. So why are we not listening to the marketplace? Mm-hmm. Yes, we still need it to like operate and live, but I mean, back to your point as far as like what we were doing before without Google, you know, imagine the next 10 years or 20 years what we're going to be doing without oil or without, yeah. you know, the, the product, right? And yeah. some people will say, oh, it's going to be around for 50 years or 100 years or mm-hmm. whatever. But it's like, do we really want to risk our life, our province's, um, you know, um, prosperity, livelihood, livelihood yeah. our kids? Um, you know, livelihood on that bet that oil and gas might be a market in 50 years. Right, you got to jump to the next crest before this one goes on the downswing. Exactly, and you know, if we can get even one more person, you know, considering like technology or like innovation or some form of like creation or emerging industry as something that they could like play ball in, Mm -hmm. right? Like I've seen some of my friends that, that live in Waterloo go from like, just moving out there, doing a simple UI UX designer course to working for Shopify, right. and now they're making eighty nine thousand bucks a year, right? Yeah. And it's not it's not always like a monetary. That's not always the figure that you have to like measure by. Yeah. You know, you have to measure by other things, but mm-hmm. like. But they also are doing something they enjoy and making that amount of money, which exactly. is great. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I think that's what, that's what's really important as to kind of what we're doing. And I'll finish with this very last story. Um, you know, and I guess our, our last tie in, our last mandate to blend the arts and innovation ecosystem together, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, for every one innovation job, so let's say, uh, you know, a job is a computer scientist or whatever, um, you know, you create five secondary jobs. So, for every one primary innovation job, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it benefactors five other other industries or five other jobs, right? Okay. What and would be an example of the downstream five? Like, what would be... So, like, jobs in, like, hospitality okay. and transportation and, yeah. um, you know, or even, like, um, you know, design or that sort of thing, right? right? And this is just, like, this is fact. This is not... I'm not making this up. This mm-hmm. is actually, like, a proven model. That's why you're seeing regions, like... San Francisco that are just so dense with talent yeah. and it's basically created its own like mini country because the GDP is so high because right. it's such a strong knowledge based economy mm-hmm. right um, so when we were I used to have a company called Made in Edmonton long story short um, it got me through university paid my bills I did it with a few friends and stuff um, we used to work with a chef his name was Kino Um, Now, Kino, at the time, he was really young, inspired at the time, Um, you know, he, he, he was, he was, he was a chef. And whenever we'd ask Kino to come do an an event with us, um, because we used to plan events, um, you know, he would put like his full energy and effort into just like, you know, cooking the food, preparing the menu for for our audience and stuff, for our guests that would, that would arrive. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think much of it at the time, other than the fact that Kino was cheaper than a catering company, <laughs> and you know it was good food that people enjoyed, right? Um, so fast forward about like five to seven years later, we're planning our second event, um, November, or with uh, with a Sea Tribe Festival. Mm-hmm. So I've moved on from Made in Edmonton. You know, I still keep in touch with, with those guys that I, I worked with. Uh, you know, I'm planning the Sea Tribe event, and we don't have budget for for food catering for this one specific event that we planned within our, our, our experience, which was the uh, Havana Nights experience. So Havana Nights was a celebration of Cuban and Latin culture, right? Because we try to bridge the art and innovation community, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we think that like culture and like the, the robustness of diversity is so important to kind of like bridging that gap. So we created this like Cuban and Latin experience uh, for, for people and we didn't have money to pay for the catering for some of the companies because there was only a very select few of Cuban authentic catering companies in right. the town, right? So we're planning this event and, you know, we were like, okay, like where can we get food from that will add to this experience? And that's when it hits me. It's like, hey, you know what? Like what, what, what if I call Kino? Mm-hmm. So I call Kino, you know, now he's a little bit older, you know, um, probably just approaching 40 and stuff. Um, and, you know, just over the phone, he didn't have the same, like, let's say, like, energy, youthful energy that he had right. you know, back then, right? But as soon as I, I presented him the opportunity to, you know, come cook for our guests and whatnot, mm-hmm. you know, you can kind of, like, 
see his you can feel his energy like lighten up again just influxes right yeah and, and like so he he makes this awesome Cuban menu we, we build almost this like brand around him because like Kino's coming to cook um, he's you know he's bringing his very authentic uh, Cuban Cuban flavor with him and he's not Cuban he's yeah. from the Caribbean but okay. he was so good at like doing like the research on as far as like the ingredients that go into the food the preparation the the, the culinary arts of the uh, of the entire uh, Latin culture that it was very authentic even to the Cuban people that, that attended and stuff yeah. right? and you know it was about four weeks before the event I called him and he put in all this work to you know, creating the menu, going to the grocery store, getting the food, and, and that sort of thing. And people were really, really, really happy with it. And after about a week and a half later, you know, I, I went for coffee with them. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was like, you know, like you put in so much effort to to this, you know, to this thing that I basically told you about that you had no idea about up until four weeks ago. Right? Why did you do it? And he was like, we're sitting in, in Remedy Cafe here. And he was like, you know what, Sar? Like, um, I work in a commercial kitchen. Every single day I serve 500 meals that I can never put a face, a name on the plate that I serve it to. People don't come back and they say thank you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe they'll, they'll tip the house um, but obviously that's shared with other people and whatnot and, yeah. and that that's okay but you know it feels that every time that I get to participate in an event like this you know people they, they're appreciative I'm allowed to share the story I'm allowed to share the art behind what I've created mm-hmm. and people really really appreciate it mm-hmm. and that's kind of when I realized that like this whole thing that we're doing to like promote the innovation ecosystem there's a really strong potential that it can kind of build the arts and culinary experience or community with it because every innovation opportunity that you provide, you know, it helps a guy like Kino, it helps a person in transportation, it helps a person, um, you know, in, in other like secondary industries to feed their family, to provide opportunity, to provide inspiration, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that was just like very, very powerful and it helped me identify what I call as like my ikigai. So ikigai is a Japanese term for, Mm -hmm. it it translates for reason for being. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, it's an alignment between four things. Uh, It's alignment between what you love, what the world needs, what the world will pay you for, and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. If you can align all those four things, you will find that in the middle of the Venn diagram is your ikigai. That's it. Right. Yeah, I love that. And I think we are really creating almost like the Cirque du Soleil of arts and innovation festivals, where we can create the systematic approach to an event that has high entertainment value, provides an educational platform for people to learn about innovation, but also taps into the grassroots of what a community is, which is the culture, which is the arts, which is the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and bring that to different cities around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if, if that can be the value that I provide to the world, I, I'm super stoked. Dude, that's unbelievable. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. So and one of the questions I really wanted to ask you is where do you see this going? And you just kind of answered it, but you want you want to see this go international. You, yeah. you, want, you want this to be your full-time thing, city to city to city. Is that right? Maybe not full time. It is my labor of love. Yeah. Um, you know, I do want to build it to a point where it is very systematic and is very operational. But mm-hmm. my heart and soul. But you, you lose that that flair, that innovative, that sort of novelty if you if you make it systematized. Don't you know it? I don't think so. No. Um, you know, I think the best in, best companies in the world, whether it's the Apples or the Googles or um, you know the Instagrams, like they're 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 innovating mm-hmm. on a consistent basis but still they have system and structure behind right. the meat and potatoes as to kind of what they provide right right as long as you set up the culture properly yeah yeah, yeah exactly um, I mean my, like I said my, my heart and soul still still lies in, in technology I think that's the quickest way to impact uh, a billion people mm-hmm. uh, you know I do want to go back to building product um, but 
other opportunities are rising. Like right now, I'm strategically involved with a, a cannabis company that mm-hmm. I think really has a potential to be like almost like the Starbucks of cannabis. Yeah. Right. Um, right and that's now, that's blowing up right now. That's like it's all everyone's talking about. Well, I mean, if you look at, I'm actually my my eleven o'clock is a, is a is a is an event at the Matrix. It's okay. If oh I'm shit, man. Right? Um, but uh, I mean, right now in Canada, there's thirty billion dollars being put into the economy, cannabis economy, mm-hmm. right? And you know, if you kind of remember back in the alcohol pro- prohibition when it ended, the same thing happened with with liquor. Mm-hmm. All these people wanted to come dump money at the product, you know, open up two hundred retail locations and whatnot, um, but. It really comes down to the to the brand, the experience, and the, the story behind it, right? Yeah. That's why companies like Red Bull and Starbucks, like they are like leaders in their field, in, mm-hmm. in, in their in their field. Like they're still their main product is still this molecule, 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 <laughs> which is like you know coffee or yeah. energy Caffe- drinks, caffeine, caffeine essentially, taurine, you know, yeah. cannabis, you know, which is you know THC or BS. CBD or whatever mm-hmm. the, the, the yep. chemical is, yep. but what kind of how, how do you inspire? How do you people? package that? How do you present it? And how do you tell people that you know this is this is where we come from? This is what we stand for, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not what you do; it's why you do it. And you know, add on to the layer that now I do have a lot of that like software technology experience and like building infrastructure around that. Like we we are creating something really really neat, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but. Yeah, I, I really think we're we're sitting on a, a real. I think just in general, we are just living in such an interesting point in our life, and mm-hmm. kind of back to back to how we started off our conversation. As far as you know, we have been taught to think so linearly, to think that you can only get one job, you can only do one thing for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's like no, well, fuck that. Like, I want to do ten things. I want to yeah. succeed at ten. Like, why is Richard Branson allowed to be a Richard Branson, yeah. or why is a Jay Z allowed to be a Jay Z? Or why is, um, you know, uh, who's the Amazon guy? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yeah. Right? Like, why can he turn Amazon into this, like, you know, behemoth of a company and I'm only told to do one thing in my life? Yeah. Because you don't stop. You don't stop improving, right? Yeah. And you just rat- ratchet it up. Um, well, again, like, super appreciative of this. We have to do it again. 100% <laughs> yeah, leading up to the event at some point. Sure. I know I'll be there for sure. Um, and... You know, I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you for you know this inspiring conversation on a Tuesday morning, and, and I, I apologize for keeping you a little bit late, <laughs> but okay. uh, but this will this will be saved in time forever awesome. Awesome. in data, and yeah. uh, we'll always have this. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I love what you're doing, man, and I think the voice space is really a good industry to be in right now and you know i do hope that you i mean i know you will continue you will be very successful and you know who knows we might be able to sit down with the next layer king here <laughs> right on, the mic is fitting yeah well i appreciate it all right so i'll let you get going thanks guys thanks for tuning in take care man yeah. later guys as always guys thank you so much for listening really appreciate the support make sure you check out sar on instagram s-a-h-r S Junior and C Tribe Festival. That's the letter C Tribe Festival. Have a great week.